Good evening, everyone. Really happy to see you all back for the next lecture. Tonight's lecture is Stephen Hall, Questions of Perception. The Department of Architecture welcomes Stephen, principal at the New York-based firm Stephen Hall Architects, who will give the Ewing Cole lecture tonight. First, we want to say that we're super grateful for Ewing Cole, again, sponsoring our lecture series. We've been a huge support for, for many, many years, actually since 2002. And it's a huge pleasure to see you here uh, every year and to have you with us. They're a valued partner, not only because they do sponsor our lecture series, but also because obviously a lot of people from Penn have internships with them and actually work for them, as we can see on the front row here, <laughs> um, which we think is absolutely fabulous. So um, thank you again. Um, I also want to welcome them by name. So welcome Keith Fallon, Inpan, Ryan Leichtswitz, Logan Weaver, Gloria Wang, Yasmin Golding, uh, and they're all from UNCO. So welcome tonight. Welcome everyone. And I would like to continue with questions of perception and our guest. For this talk, Stephen re uh, revisits the questions of perception, a text he uh, co-authored with Alberto Perez Gomez and Johanny Palasma, in which Hall explored phenomenology of architecture through 11 phenomenal zones, and meshed experience, pers perspectival space of color, of light and shadow, spatiality of night, time, duration, and perception, water, and a phenomenal lens of sound, detail, the haptic realm, proportion, scale, and perception. Sight, circumstance, and idea. Incorporating recent projects by Stephen Hall Architects realized after the book's publication, Stephen recast and reconnects new build works with these original concepts. Stephen Hall graduated from the University of Washington and pursued architecture studies in Rome. In 1976, he joined the Architectural Association in London, but shortly after actually already established Stephen Hall Architects. <coughs> Stephen Hall is a 28-person innovative. 28 is always relative, right? It could be 50, and it could be anything else. So you can update us. us. I mean, it's, it's a number we found, but... I know how fluctuating that is. Before you know it, you have double. Innovative architecture and urban design office working globally as one office from two locations, New York City and Beijing, China. Stephen Hall leads the office with partners Chris McVoy, Noava Yafi, and Roberto Banura. Stephen is also a tenured, architect, a tenured professor at Columbia University in New York since uh, 1981 and has taught at University of Washington, Pratt Institute, and the University of Pennsylvania. Actually, more than teaching that, he built also the building for Pratt Institute, which was a huge relief. Thank you, Stephen. That was probably not your most important project, but it was, for architecture students, the most important project, because that was the best change of anything I've ever seen. Um, considered one of America's most influential architects, he is recognized for his ability to blend space and light with great contextual sensibility and to utilize the unique qualities of each project to create a concept-driven design. He specializes in seamless integrating new projects into context with particular cultural and historical importance. He has realized both in the projects, both in the United States and of course a lot of them international, Including, I'm just mentioning some of the recent buildings since Stephen has quite an extensive repertoire. But the most recent buildings are the Reed Building at the Glasgow School of Art, the University of Iowa Visual Arts Building, the Lewis Arts Complex at Princeton University, Princeton, the Maggie Center Art Barts in London and the UK, the Institute for Contemporary Art at Virginia Commonwealth University, uh, the Glassell School of Art in the, for the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, Texas, the REACH, the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, a really important building in Washington, uh, Hunters Point Library in Queens, um, which I actually recently saw going by by boat, 
and the Museum of Fine Arts also in Houston, Texas, and the last one was in 2020. Stephen received a ton of awards. Among the recent ones are 2016 Velix Daylight Award in Architecture, the 2014 Premium Imperial International Arts Award for Architecture, the 2012 AIA Gold Medal, the 2010 RIBA Jenks Award, and the first ever Arts Award for the BV BBVA Foundation Frontiers of Knowledge Awards in 2008. In 2003, he was named an honorary fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architects, which is quite an achievement. I'm the external examiner for the RBA, so I know how that works. And the 2002 Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum awarded him their prestigious National Design Award in Architecture. In 2001, France bestowed Stephen the Grand Médaille d'Or uh, upon him for the best architecture for the Academy of Architecture. Stephen, of course, has lectured and exhibited widely and has published numerous texts, including the recent Architecture Spoke in 2007, Urbanisms Working with Dow 2008, Hamsum Hall Harnassi uh, in 2010, Horizontal Skyscraper in 2011, Color Light Time in 2012, and Scale also in 2012. And of course, the most recent Urban Hopes in 2013 was an article in Domus. I always personally really love the series you started, Pamphlet, which was huge when I was a student, which is of course a while ago, but I think is still, they actually collect this item, so I've noticed, I was trying to find one the other day, and was going to find them on uh, Amazon, and I don't think I can afford it anymore, I should have bought it then. But uh, I think I lost it or whatever, moving. But yeah, that was a spectacular series, and it was really important at that moment in architecture. I remember that's how I found you also. Uh, so please welcome Stephen Hall to Weizmann Architecture. <laughs> I'm very grateful to be here. We just opened a pamphlet architecture exhibition last weekend, one through 37, and in honor of Kevin Lippert, who passed away last two months ago, great publisher, and he was the one that kept that going. Between number one and 10, it was just us trying you know, to deliver the thing. And then Kevin saw the, the value of it, and he kept it going to number 37. So it's interesting that you mentioned that. I'm, I'm very grateful to be here, and I was just reflecting. I taught here in 1980, which, because Lee Copeland was the dean. He came from the University of Washington. So he says, come down and teach a studio. And it was great, because Ann Ting was on my juries. She just, and then we would have all these incredible discussions. You know, she worked for Con for 29 years. She worked on the Trenton Bathhouse, Salk Institute, Yale Art Galleries, so that was a connection for me because as the beginning, sorry about this little story because I don't want to go just into this heavy stuff. Um, as a beginning, I wanted to do something more. After I got registered, I was going to go back to graduate school and get a master's degree because I don't have a master's degree. Don't tell my students. I'm teaching them to get a degree that I do not have, believe it or not. Anyway, so I was accepted at Yale, MIT, and Columbia. I went to each one of them. I didn't like what they were doing. I didn't like, you know, and I decided I'm taking my savings. I'm going to work for Lucan. I'm just going to volunteer. So I came to Philadelphia, and I was interviewed by a man by the name of Foot. He looked at my portfolio, and he said, I'm sure that Lou will approve. You know, you can count on it. And I went back to San Francisco. I was finishing my oral exam on the way to the oral exam when I read in the paper that Lucan died on March 17th. You know, and I just, it just threw me off. And that was what I was going to do. And then I was lost for a year. 1975 was completely lost. I was in San Francisco. I went to work for Lawrence Halpern. But Alvin Boyarsky came through and said, come to the AA, the Architecture Association. Ooh, interesting, you know. Charles Jenks, Rem Koolhaas, Leon Creer. And we discovered Zaha. And that's a, it's a whole story that I would have to give another lecture. But the connection to Philadelphia is deep in my mind, because this, this is where I wanted to live in 1974 and 75. So it's good, it's good to be here again. 
And I always love coming here. I, I love the Frank Furness building. I keep, that's one of my favorite buildings. So I, I, I started um, working on a manifesto when I was invited to do a show at the Museum of Modern Art in 1988. And I decided that I was against the idea of a style move being taken from one side to the next, that, that a theory of architecture had to be a principle based on anchoring into the site. That is, the circumstance, the site, the program, the people, the climate. Then the architect has an idea unique to that situation. And that was this, that was this manifesto. And I, I still work with that, but then I thought, when after I wrote that, I thought, wait a minute, there's a lot of fundamental things, you know, like, I mean, after all, 23 B BC, uh, Vitruvius, you know, firmness, utility, and delight, you know, I mean, there's these fundamentals, and what are they now, what are they today, you know, what are the fundamentals today? And I, I was given a grant by Toshio Nakamura to write a special issue of ANU, and I said, let's try, to, let's try to think about what are the fundamental issues, not the idea that drives the design, but what are the fundamental issues that everybody faces, and by the way, in history. It's not about something trendy, you know. And by the way, at this time, you know, uh, the Museum of Modern Art was putting up deconstruction. Mark Wigley had written a manifesto that everything has to be twisted and bent and all that. So I was, that wasn't my... Forte, I wanted to do, I wanted to think deeper and longer in history. So I made these zones with Johanni and Alberto, I made these zones. And one of them is enmeshed experience. We never, we never really experience architecture as an object. We, we work on it in a model, you know, in our studio, but then when you really experience it, you see partial views. Like when zebras run, the uh, lions can't see them because the stripes all get into a big, you know, and this notion of this outside and the inside, this storefront for art and architecture that I did with Theodore Aconci, where the outside and the inside are blurred, hinged space, moving the outside from the inside. Or this Robert Frank photo when you're sitting in the barber chair and the screen door is reflected in the glass and that merges with the view of you. What is your perception? It's an enmeshed experience. You see the trees, you see you know, the outside, and the inside. As we move through buildings, we move through perspectival space. This is something that it's very hard to, to capture in an image. It's a series, of, a section of spaces. And right at that time, I did a, a, a program. It was a competition for the Porta Vittoria in Milan. And I, was, I knew I was going to be up against Emilio Battisti and all protégés of Aldo Rossi, Leon Creer. And they talked about morphology and typology as the beginning of thinking about architecture. I, I still think typology is very important. But the morphology of the city and the typology of the buildings, so it was always planimetric. So I said, I don't want to do that. You can see a kind of Aldo Rossi-like drawing on the left. I want to start from perspective and project the perspectives back into plans. And that was a way of working also in models. This is the Chapel of St. Ignatius, um, where we worked on the inside with models, working backwards to the plans, not to put the plan down first. A section on color, but color is a phenomena, not something you just put paint on a wall. And the, this building was all done in reflected color. All the color is on the backside and reflected by natural light bouncing into the interior was the D.E. Shaw headquarters, 1991. But then we took that idea further. No, there's no color on the actual space. It's all reflected color. And light and shadow is something I think that's so important in, in every work we do. That's why I have my students work in models to this day and photograph them in the sunlight. Because if you just use the computer drawings, they don't tell you the actual truth. So, I mean, the, the condition of shadow, I mean, that was a house in Martha's Vineyard. James Terrell's first work, the uh, Mendota stoppages in Los Angeles, where he, he took uh, tape off the glass. He had blackened out his studio and, and worked with the pieces of sunlight that came in. Terrell worked with light, you know, and then spatiality of night. That 
that architecture, especially in the 20th century, 21st century, is dealing with thinking about how it feels and, and what is it like at night, especially when there's mist in the air, like in New York or San Francisco. That was our Berlin Library in 1989 that we won. Time. Bergson says, we don't, we don't really know what time is, but we know what duration is. So in a way, that, that whole, mm, let's, let's say, meditation on duration. And in and, and, and terms of phenomenology, the, the work of Maurice Merleau-Ponty, really, that was one of the aspects that allows him to break away from the, the, this sort of dialectic of mind and body. And that was a project that was about measuring time, the Palazzo del Cinema. Water, a phenomenal lens. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest where there's a gigantic body of water, Puget Sound, so I could see the sunrise, you know, ever since I was like four years old or whatever, I was meditating on this, how the, the sunlight reflects on the water or how a full moon reflects on the bay and, and creates a strip of light across the water. So this, you know, the, the world is three quarters water, our body is three quarters water. I think it's very important in architecture. And that, somebody says, how come all your projects have water in them? Well, maybe that's part of my idea. That's Fukuoka. And that my first big building, 1988 and 89, of sound. This is an anechoic chamber. This is a house was done in 1989 based on a piece of music by Bela Bartok. And we, we had an incredible client, a beautiful client, uh, Charles and Jesse Price. Um, this is my beginning as an architect. I had a studio with about three people. Winka worked there for a little while one time. In my little, there were four people or something like that. Right. And this, I had this show at the Museum of Modern Art, and these people came, Charles and Jesse Price, that's the Price Tower from Bottlesville, Oklahoma. They said, well, we, we came to New York to hire an architect, and we, we were going to interview Peter Eisenman and Michael Graves and Charles Gwathney, but we saw your show, and we want you to do our house. So this was incredible. It was like, I thought my, you know, that only happened to me once, by the way. <laughs> Detail the haptic realm, which is something I'll get into in a minute, but all of our projects are are really carefully detailed because that's where your body touches the building, where your hand touches the building. Uh, to me, the building and you are in, interacting. That goes back to Merleau-Ponty's idea of the body is, a, is an instrument of sensation. Right? It's an instrument of perception and proportion. You know, you know this, this joint to that joint to that joint is 1 to 1.618, the golden section, historic, you know, you know, uh, Alberti used it, you know, Brunelleschi used it, uh, Lou Kahn used it, Louis Sullivan used it, Mies van der Rohe used it. So I always try to organize the proportions in relationships to each other, like my first house in 1978, 44 years ago. <clears throat> so this is a video, 11 minute video. The architecture from the giant no matters, no doors. From origins of architecture, we explore in, that is, that the interior is more important than the exterior. This is what we live in. I'm Stephen Hall, architect, and when you're the exit in the house in Miranda. And I think that's okay, and I think it's like, we'll go to you to design this house. This project started really as research, a kind of experimental project. Studio. So we started with the Peter Slaughternack's trilogy about spheres in three volumes. We wanted to work with the ideas that he was working with. You're born in a sphere, the universe. You come out into the sphere of your family. You inhabit it, the globe. And then there's a kind of idea of the form of the universe, the political form of reality. What we did was we made a bunch of drawings and made models where we we had a trapezoidal volume and it was being intersected by spheres. And what we were interested in was the interior. And we called the project Explorations of N, X of N. And that's how this house got its name, because it came out of these models and these drawings. The 
That's by Toyo Ito, that, that table. That's wrong, but we didn't correct it. part of the concept uh, models that uh, initiated the design of this house. This is actually the west cut. This window is right in here. So if you invert the spheres, you get the negative space, which is the house itself. So this conceptual model, we like to explore in all different scales and make it part of the experience of the house. These light fixtures are printed out of uh, corn-based bioplastic. That's a 3D printing material. The geometry forms this kind of cutout that provides privacy for the bed next to the window with a natural ventilation. This piece of the bathtub was crafted by Javier Gomez, our contractor. So all the details that you see are handcrafted. And the whole house is made like a piece of furniture. It's made like a, the interior of a guitar or, of, or, or a piece of instrument. And uh, it's, uh, it's crafted with lots of care and for every detail. And here is a very exciting space. As you go up over the sphere, 
that uh, we, we entered the house. And this space is meant to be a kind of raw space where you see the structure of the sphere, you see the ribs that, that they had to cut to form the interior where they shaped the wood in this kind of curved layers. And that's also a very exciting spot as you come up and you have this uh, nook that's very private and then also you can look down and the entire space opens up in kind of big surprise I think as you really are up against the ceiling and the space slopes down into the open living room. That's really a space of compression and decompression and looking out. Water is life. This water pond literally brought life onto the site as we position it to the south. And not only does it activate and illuminate the interior with water reflecting through into the interior, but it also, with the water lilies that we brought into this pond, brought the frogs in and the turtles. And they are really a beautiful company to have in this surrounding. We want it to be as ecological as possible. It has closed cell insulation. This is all natural wood, no finishes, no you know, sort of toxic materials at all. Even the wooden windows are all solid mahogany cut and without any finish on them. That's a natural pine board floor. And it has a geothermal heating and cooling system. And that works perfectly. In the wintertime, it can be zero degrees outside. It's 70 in here with the radiant floor. And in the summertime, we're using that same 51 degrees that's 300 feet below the surface of the earth and cooling it. The water here is natural well water. We get eight gallons per minute at 300 feet and it's pure water. It's very pure. So there's no chlorine in it. And even the facade is weighed out of a special stucco that's called poraver. And that was an experimental application. This material is made out of 100% recycled glass. And it's very lightweight and porous. So the concept of the sphere that goes into all of the different scales of the kind of human experience comes down to those tiny little one Micro. millimeter. So no fossil fuels, geothermal heating and cooling, organic materials, preserve the natural landscape, 30 acres of preservation. You know, I just saw a wild fox the other day running out of, an orange wild fox. There's a pond with frogs and turtles. They eat the mosquitoes. You can have water that comes off of your roof, collect all your rainwater, but if you make it ecological, that is turtles and frogs, you don't have any mosquitoes. The most important thing is nature. Preserve what's here and uh, allow for the wildlife to exist around the house. So when you come and look out the windows, you see you're surrounded by animals and the sound of the frogs and the turtles passing. The way to make this abstract thinking of the sphere into a site-specific project is how to orient it so that the light comes in and works within the space in these different times of the day. The way this roof is sloping to the south made a perfect place for the solar panels to come on and all of these different adjustments that happened once you know this is a location. And the passive aspect in terms of the energy use, the way it's isolated and it works with natural ventilation has also to do specifically with this location. So this is the future, right? We're living in a time, in a place. Different places in the world have different conditions of right now. And we're lucky to be in the Hudson Valley. It gets cold, it snows, but that's part of the excitement. Big, nice snow, you know, outside. Moonlight reflecting on snow coming in through these round windows, gorgeous absolute silence, stars in the sky, and then autumn. This is all orange and yellow and red out here, like New England is, you know. I grew up in Seattle, and the trees just don't turn, you know, kind of a pale yellow. Here you get bright orange and red and yellow and some green mixed in. So it's like living in a painting in fall. We've entered a new phase in humanity where we actually understand the brain in ways we never understood it before. There was that old adage that Winston Churchill said, first we shape our buildings and then they shape us, right? 
Well, that was 1944. This now we know is somewhat true. So in, in a certain sense, we passed into a new phase of understanding the importance of architecture. Light, space, volume is very important to human existence, to psychology. There's a kind of winter sickness where there's not enough light in a space. But now we also understand that daylight and the way the seasonal light works on your body and your psyche through your brain is something that architecture can contribute to health. The first thing we did is we commissioned the great poet Robert Kelly to write a poem about this property. And he spent two months working on this poem, Phases of the Earth. Where he says, so poetry and music make time pass, and architecture makes space pass into meaningful form. No, I mean architecture makes music stand still. That's more like it. Here, time turns into space. That's one of my favorite yeah, kind of yeah, yeah. moments of that. What is time? What is space? How can poetry and art and architecture connect? How do they connect? That's Demetra Zagrelia, by the way, and she's a partner at SHA, and she's a genius. And she figured out, you know, we built that house on a whim because I wanted to stop the subdivision. There was going to be a five-house subdivision, 30 acres. So I offered some low price. I got the land. I said, what are we going to do with this? So we made it all a preserve, and we only have this tiny house in the middle. And we did this experiment, but then the, the property taxes and all this problem. She is Airbnb being this house, and it pays all of, it's booked up. You can't even, you can go to Airbnb and try to go there, but it's booked up until February right now. I mean, it's, and Demetra, and also she was instrumental in the design. It isn't just me. I mean, I, she's going to, she's going to become a partner. Um, you know, I think it's, yeah, that's, that's, anyway, this, what I'm going to do now which I hate when people show too many projects. I'm going to show 13 projects and try to link them to the, th the ideas of questions and perception. So I'm not going to do what I think you should do as an architect. I think you should show one building in excruciating detail, plans and sections and everything. Maneo did that when he was a chairman at the GSD, but not for today. This is the Kennedy Center. It was a competition. Um, it's a living memorial, whereas the Lincoln Memorial and the Jefferson Memorial are just... And our idea was to put the whole thing below ground, and the idea of glissando, that something is below the ground, is coming up. Like when you take a bow over a violin, and you can play all the strings, you get a glissando. So that was, that was the main concept, and then to make it all a landscape. It was a wonderful uh, project because the client was understanding. In the, end, in the end, we were up against Diller Scafidio, Raphael Vignoli, Meyer, everybody. And then they said, we, you know, Stephen, your project is interesting, but you can't build it because there's all this sewer lines and utilities. And we told everybody to stay out of the landscape. I said, give us a chance. Just give us a, another round. We will work with the engineers and prove that we can weave around this stuff. And that's, that's how we won. Anyway, most of the building is underground. It's the largest green roof in Washington, D.C., and I won't show it in detail, but it, the idea of water, a phenomenal lens, is definitely here. There's the river. There's the Potomac. The bridge, <clears throat> originally we wanted to float the river pavilion. We couldn't float it because of the Army Corps of Engineers and the rowing clubs, so we put it on ground, and then, but we got to do the bridge and get over that highway to get down to the river. And it's really a place of joy. During the COVID time, it was, it was really very wonderfully used. This is the Winter Arts Center, Franklin and Marshall College, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Beautiful campus. Um, and there was an original brick rectangular building, and they wanted to double the size. Ben Winter was giving the money. It's called the Winter Arts Center. And I actually made this sketch for the interview. 
I said, Ben Franklin, you know, what it reminds me of to think about Ben Franklin is that story where it was rainy night and he had a kite, he was flying a kite and lightning struck the kite and he could, you know, electricity, there was a key on the kite, this idea of a kite. And then Marshall was a lawyer, that's heavy stuff, right? So I just drew this light and heavy, that there would be something heavy and something light floating. And that, that's sort of an idea, but then when I studied the site, we got the project. We, you know, we were hired. It was a long process, six months, but we were hired, and that was the only thing I showed. I was saying, and then I said, "That's not. That's not deep enough. You know, that's a rather superficial kind of reading." I wanted to float it in the in the in the land in the in in, in the trees, but then I discovered these gigantic trees. They're spe this is like a a. a, a a, 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 a reserve of gigantic trees, and I took the diameters of these trees and made the building fit between them. So doubling the size from what they tore down that was on the site, and now you have a shape that has, you know, a concept that's relating directly to the, to the landscape. <clears throat> and then when we, you see the heavy, that's a concrete wall, below, and then the light is like a truss. We make it like a box kite. So the idea of the kite come back, comes back into the process. Very thin members, but they go the full height of this building. And the program, we, we, you know, we got everything in there they wanted. Printmaking studio, painting studio, design studios, cinema. And the idea that it's floating, that I wanted to make the underside this sort of blue of New England porches. You know, that's a kind of tradition in New England. The underside of a porch is painted blue, but you would see that reflected in the, the pool. And then it's Lancaster, Pennsylvania, it's Amish. So I said, can we get the Amish to work on this? So we got Amish workers to do all the TNG wood for the, for the roof, and that's, that's all structural. So that sketch of the idea of the lightweight box kite framing and then this TNG roof. And there you can f kind of feel how that tree is causing this geometry to be what it is. And then in London, this, this, this is really a, an essay in color in a way. Maggie Center in London, this was uh, I was invited by Charles Jenks, bless his soul, to do the most difficult site of the Maggie Centers. And this is a cancer care center open to the public and a wonderful organization, small site, and right in the center of London. So I had to go through, uh, I don't know, 60 different presentations to different committees. I finally got smart and made a video about all the issues and instead of flying over there all the time. One time I flew over there and they only gave me three minutes. They, they put a red light on, rang a bell, said your time is up. <laughs> you know, it was really, but anyway, because of Laura Lee, Zaha was behind us, Rem supported it, and a lot of support somehow. We didn't give up and we got it through. And, and, and the basic idea was this is, this is a, a building really about comfort, so I, I, the inner layer is like a bamboo basket, it's all natural bamboo. The, the structure is like a concrete hand, and the outside is a, a staff, a musical notation, because this is right next to St. Bart's, and back in the 11th century, they made this thing called noon notation, before musical notation. So I made this a, a, a sort of staff, and then I made this colored noom notation, and we invented this sort of stained glass that's made out of Ocalux, which is super insulated glass, and then it has this kind of polar bear hair internal, and then there's a color field in there, and that was actually produced for the, for the project. Models. <clears throat> it's a simple and small project, but it opened on my 70th birthday, so I was very proud of that in London. Finally, after studying at the AA, to come back and put something in London. And if you ever get to London, it's open to the public, so you can go and visit. They love architects to come and, you know, they, and Laura Lee is just a, just loves architecture. 
But what's interesting is the color at night, it glows on the outside. And then in the daytime, it glows on the inside. And so it, it kind of disappears. And this is uh, the Hunter's Point Library in Queens, all these condominiums. And the story is one of these developers said to the community, you can have a whole bottom three floors for free if you let us build on your site. And Jimmy Von Klemper, a, a congressman in Queens said, no, we want a public building. Good for him because uh, we're at the whim of developers today. It's really hard. So then, you know, and then Jimmy Van Klemper said, let's have a building that we can see Manhattan because these people from the community, they're, you know, they're people that, there are a lot of immigrants, they're trying to learn English, they come to the library to get help, but then they could have a view of Manhattan. So that was, that's how the building, the building could have been built as a horizontal one-story building, but because of the client, by the way, if you're going to study architecture, that's great, and I love it. But if you're going to practice, you have to remember one thing, that the client is more than 50% of the equation every time. You've got you to be lucky to find a good client. Jimmy Van Klemper, you know. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> no, I mean, without the client, you're dead. You know, really, it's... Uh, it's true, and what a beautiful site. I mean, there's Lou Kahn's, you know, FDR memorial. There's, there's uh, Oscar Niemeyer, Lake Corbusier said he, but Oscar Niemeyer's UN complex, and there's our little building. It's just a tiny building. And then the idea of the digital in the book. At Columbia, they were giving a studio called, you know, the end of the book or whatever, libraries for the end of the book. Well, I don't think the book is ever gonna die. <clears throat> just like drawing won't die. I, I, I have a video called Drawing is Thought. And uh, anyway, we balanced the digital in the book because behind the bookshelves are computer desks. So everybody on their computer desk, and as you come in, you can see the books. But then you see a diagonal view to, the, to Manhattan in the distance. So the whole movement in the building vertically starts to cut the facades and then I decided no columns, no skin. This is just the concrete structure of the building, stained silver, and, and that's it. And that was the model in my studio. And, and it was a long process. It was rejected, it was, but Jimmy Von Klemper kept pushing for it. We made lots of models, we exhibited. And then it was, some, it was a fluke of funding that came through that pushed the building, and then when it opened, de Blasio took my five minutes or my three minutes to make a speech. He never was involved in it in at all. The mayor comes in and, sa and says, yeah, I didn't even get to speak at the opening. Anyway, that's what happens to architect, but it doesn't matter, it's really, it's about the public space. This is the children's library. My daughter was there. She loves those curved bamboo surfaces, all natural. And, and by the way, that's Manhattan, and it's full of these gigantic condominiums, and I'm really happy not to be doing those. I mean, I, I, I think it's a, a shame. Um, there are very few of them that are any good, you know? And that little tiny public building, you know, is, is kind of like the little, the little, what is it called? The little blue engine that could? I think I could, I think I could. That's a kind of children's story. And this is the Glasshell School of Art, Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. This is a competition we won, um, which I didn't expect to win. We were against Tom Main, and we were against, uh, um, how do you say it, Snohetta? I wanted to say Odetta, but it's Snohetta. Like Zaha, she always nicknamed everybody Schmerzog. De Marone, Schmerzog, she called them. Anyway, we were, they were in this too, but they were, all, they were gone in the first round. Anyway, so, uh, but the problem, the problem was very complicated. They wanted to build a new museum, but this, this, this museum was on a church site, which was a parking lot. All those cars had to be parked somewhere. So you were supposed to build a parking garage over here, seven stories. And, you know, I said, that's really to build a parking garage as your first move? 
And I said, I, you know, this took a lot of nerve. I said, no, you should tear down the existing glass hill school. It's too small anyway. You should build a new glass hill school and put all the parking underneath, a layer underneath. And now you can go directly from the parking that's over here and you can, you know, go to the parking that's on. So the, the whole problem was they had to displace that church parking in the first round. So we did it. And in the end, we, you know, this is a building that had to be super, super cheap. So this is a precast concrete. That is the structure of the building done in Waco, Texas, big pieces. And that's the whole language of the building, just an L. And then it has a, a ramp that goes up and you can see the whole campus from the roof. So that, that L-shaped building then gives you a view of the whole campus. Very simple studios. But there, there you can walk up that green roof and then view that whole campus. And then these, and then at the corner of the L, there's a kind of, um, a, a sort of gathering space, a sort of, and there's, <laughs> there's been incredible rap videos done on, on, on this stage, and weddings have taken place here already. And there it is under construction. You can see the, the pieces are just precast, and that's the wall, that's the solid exterior wall. And Chiyida, the, the, the one great sculptor that I love from Basque country, Chiyida has his only, really, the first big piece of sculpture that he did was for the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston and they put it in front of our building. They moved it from another side, and I was really happy because I feel some relationship to the work of Chiida. I think he's one of the underappreciated great sculptors. By the way, Chiida studied architecture first before he became a sculptor. There you see the whole complex. There you see the Mies van der Rohe's only museum in America with a curve. You see the sculpture garden, which is much larger. You see the museum itself, which is the object of the competition. But when I presented this, I presented this model, and I, you know, we had to, you know, tell the whole story of the museum. And I said, "Look, you see, first of all, you're going to have to expand your glass house school anyway. At some point in the future, now you've you've got a place for it, and your sculpture garden will be a little larger than Dallas." I think that's what, that's what got it. We got a unanimous vote to go this way. I mean, you, you have to be persuasive, right? I mean, who cares if it's a little bit bigger than Dallas? They do. The trustees do. The trustees really cared. And there's the finished building. It opened in 20, in the middle of COVID. And I, I didn't go down there in the opening. I went down to the Glass Hill opening. That was based on the idea of, Clouds in Texas, the big, huge sky of Texas sky, and the clouds would be so big that they would push the roof, and then the light would slip in underneath those curves. And bah, that was a hard idea to, to figure out. Man, we, I don't know how many models, 60, 70 models. But the circulation is never dead-ended. It's always, you can close off one gallery and walk by, and you know, Chris McBoy, my, my partner, has done, you know, so much work on circulation. I think that goes back to perspectival space, the idea in the first, you know, points that the experience of a building is a, a series of perspectival spaces that overlap. So when you're doing a museum, moving through it is the most important thing and how those spaces overlap and what happens after one and the other. And if you want to do it wrong, just go to the Museum of Modern Art. They got it all wrong. Oh, oops. And there you can see the, the light coming from the, 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 the roof that's pushed down. And the light slips in diffused ways on the curves. And then we said, this was from the competition, and it took us a while. We said we wanted to make the building have a cold jacket. That would be hollow glass tubes where the sunlight, the hot Texas sun, is drawn up and therefore it reduces the solar gain on the building by 90%. And we struggled with that and, and we found in China a manufacturer that could do it. And so we had these 20, 25 foot high, 30 inch in diameter glass tubes and they, they, they glow at night 
of course, because you have the openings behind. And then during the day, they're, they're drawing the hot air off the facade. And Olaf or Eliasson did the tunnels. So the, all those parking experiences are pretty interesting because they're artwork. You know, when they, when they connected Moneo's building to Mises' building, they hired James Terrell to do a tunnel. If, has anybody been in that James Terrell tunnel? Oh, nobody goes to Houston? Okay, well, anyway. Um, but if you go there, don't miss this one because this is new and this is a law for Elias and, and that, this is connecting in the other direction. So now, you know, the tunnels are works of art. That's experiences, right? They're experiences. There's the Mies van der Rohe building. There you see the, the Nomaneo building and our building. I, I had to put this in because Winka chose a project from 12 years ago for the poster, right? Did you do the poster? I didn't do the poster. Who did the poster? I love the poster. Yeah, but, Really? Anyway, they got a project from 12 years ago, so I have to tell this story. It's kind of tragic. I always like to forget failures. That's another key. If, you, if, you, if you're an architect, one of the things you're going to find out is you're going to fail. You know, you're going to be fired or they're going to not build it. It's going to happen a lot. And one of the tricks I have is I just forget about it. I mean, seriously. So this is a terrible failure. Now I have to remember it, okay? So, uh, so this is, you know, it's 2013. We were hired, and I think in 2011, we're working on this. It's a new city in Tianjin. They're, they're, it's, it's called Echo City Tianjin. And, and, and this was a competition, and it's a long story, but we won the centerpiece of the whole city. And it was an ecology museum and a planning museum. This is something they do in China. A planning museum is a typical thing where they show how the whole town is going to lay out. And it's about architecture. But then they wanted to do ecology museum. As, so I decided that these two buildings would talk to each other like a bagua, like the, like the one would be the subtraction of the other. And they're each 300,000 square feet. They're big buildings, big and I had this kind of innocent idea, 9112. I remember when I drew this in Rhinebeck. I have a studio in Rhinebeck, and I was in my watercolor shack, and I drew this idea that this would just be this would be the subtraction of that. And they they liked it, and we kept going. And then they had a very bad program for the ecology museum. It was not very good. In, in, inspiring. So I said, let's make, you know, this is going to be the largest ecology museum in the world. We have to make it important. Let's change the concept that there are three ecologies. There's earth to earth, 3.4 billion years. There's human to earth, 200,000, if that, right? Not so long. And there's Earth to Cosmos. That's really long. How, we don't even know how long. I mean, now we're just discovering there's a black hole in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy. I mean, we're just finding this stuff out. So one third of the museum could be all these new discoveries. Anyway, they loved it. I had an incredible client. They, they commissioned us. I had people in Beijing office and New York office cranking out the working drawings. And... And it was amazing. I, I couldn't believe this is all going to get built. It won a PA award, so it was, not, it was noticed in America. And then you, this idea of carving out, then you can see how that, that, that basic idea then shapes the interior spaces. That's how you get that interior space. But what happened was, on the 13th of March, 2013, if you remember, if anybody watched, the Pope was being chosen in Rome. And there's a little stovepipe that comes out of the Vatican. And if they didn't choose a Pope, it's black smoke. And if they choose a Pope, it's white smoke. Well, I was in China watching that. And it came out white smoke, you know. So Pope Francis was chosen. It was incredible. But the very next day, Xi Jinping was chosen. And then, like, a month later, I went to my site, 
the, my, the boss was gone. He wasn't there anymore. And the new guy who was in charge wouldn't meet with me. And there's a full-size mock-up of all the materials of the building. And we, they, we never heard another. There was never any more. It was just over, just overnight. Welcome to China. <laughs> anyway, the working drawings were done. <laughs> all the materials were decided. The client that I loved, I don't, I don't even know where he went. I mean, maybe he, they took him away. Or, I don't know what happened. Maybe he's with Ai Weiwei in jail. I don't know what happened. <clears throat> that was sad. And then this is a competition that we won in 2018. It's the entrance to a campus, and they wanted an iconic building. So this is the new gate to the campus. It has to be an iconic building. You have to be able to see it from the freeway here, yeah. going into double. You see the, oh, and then this is like three million square feet. So I mean, all the other buildings, kind of calm, light and air dimension, nothing. And I said, let's put all the energy in the. You know, most of the buildings will be calm and a green roof, and but then let's do something vertical. And then in the competition, I was against Liebeskin and Liz Diller and. MDRD, all of them. And then because you had to see the building from the freeway, they, they stacked the whole, it was a program for architecture and engineering and uh, auditorium. And they stacked everything up. And when I presented my scheme, I said, you know, first of all, I took the ideas from James Joyce, Ulysses, which is stream of consciousness thinking, where you, whatever it is you're doing, you sort of, you let it flow, you let it, fold. And the second thing I took was from Giant's Causeway, which is a 50 million year old rock formations that are all made out of these hexagons in, in Ireland. I don't know if you, if you can look that up and it's very amazing it's sort of basalt formations. And they're not all hexagons. Some of them are five-sided, some of them are four-sided. So I studied that geometry. And by the way, I've never done a hexagon in my life. So I wanted this to be, you know, about that site. And then the other thing is, and there's a zinc model. That's the auditorium. This is looking from behind. Now, you have to see this from the freeway. But we did a horizontal building. I put all the design studios horizontal. So engineering, architecture, and everything. And so the vertical part, the tower, is at 23 degrees, the tilt of the Earth's, Earth's axis. So there's a scientific aspect. And it's always raining in Dublin. So this is kind of, it's like my hometown, Seattle. It's always raining. And, and uh, we, we prevailed. We got a unanimous decision to, to go forward. And so this is, it's a very simple, concrete is exposed structure and a zinc skin. And another entrance to campus is the Lewis Center for the Arts in Princeton that opened in 2017. And there you see, you, you, when you come to Princeton, you come on the dinky, dinky train, you get out right here. Rick Joy is the station, so that's the Rick Joy building, and you walk right to our room. So this, this was the idea of the president, Shirley Tillman. She said, the arts need to be recognized on the campus. They need to be seen. So when people, no matter what they're in, medicine, science, law, whatever, when they come in and out of the campus, they can see things like practice rooms and dance. And so that was the whole idea. And that was her program and was wonderful. She was a great client. And that's the sort of model. And then each building has a different, like the dance is a thing within a thing. So the di different studios are different materials within that form. And the poetry and the literature and the gallery are embedded. And then the music is, the collective is underneath. This is uh, the orchestral Orchestral practice hall is one of the big pieces of the program. And then individual practice rooms would be suspended on rods to make them acoustically separate was another. And there's that, that building, you can see the structure runs in the long direction. But these, there's a video, you know, most of these projects, if you're interested, you can go on Vimeo and there's videos, long videos that tell the story of the project. But that was a great, that was a great moment. And this, this part of the program, I added, it's 8,000 square feet. Can you imagine an architect adding 8,000 square feet onto a program? Well, the provost said, 
it's too big, Stephen. And I said, it's not big enough. Anyway, Shirley Tigman, the president, I got a lot of support. And this is one of the most used spaces because people want to hang out on their laptops, on, you know, on their computers, meet each other. You can get a coffee here. It joins the, all the things above. But the cool the part that I like is that the pond, the water pond, these guy lights are in the water pond. So you get this, this condition. And that is not from this building, but that's from my Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City. And that's in the parking garage. But I don't have time to show you that project. But this idea of water, a phenomenal lens. I'm just going to link now back to three more points. The idea of spatiality of night. So we were thinking about that when we're doing the design before you know, we finished doing our models and how this building is also about porosity. It's a sponge. There it is at night. And the students love it, and they even made an opera. I think it's in here. Oh, spongy sponge, our many window dorm, all those within, so welcoming and warm, with curvy walls and plastic balls and modularity. From far and wide, we've come to join in this vibrant community. Our study breaks are known to all for pancakes and smoothies. From dusk till dawn, oh spongy sponge, dogs guard your yin yang sea. Let's keep our dorm Velociraptor free Oh, spongy sponge We stand on guard for thee For Simmons Hall is the best dorm at Good for the students. But that was also a great client. Charles Vest, bless his soul, the president, was totally behind what we're, you know, he, they, he hired Frank Gehry, and they did amazing things. And uh, that's a long story. And, and this is just short, because I'm almost finished. So of sound, and this was a competition for the Ostrava Concert Hall, which is now going into construction this fall. And the idea was a perfect acoustic instrument in its case. That's all. So the problem was there's an existing building here which needs to be renovated and preserved. And, the, and all the other competitors, this is the Esplanade. This is noisy, street parts, and everything. So you had a choice. You could either put the building on the park side, which half of the competitors did, or put it on the front side and then risk all the noise and then it's not a very good site. And I made this one sketch, and Demetra said, that is a winning idea. That was made on my brother's birthday, 10, 25, 18. And then we just, that's it, a perfect instrument in his case, but we jump over the building. So now it's almost all the working drawings are there, and we got government funding. But the main thing is the sound. It has to be perfect. So we had, I mean, you, we had to hire Naguda Acoustic. And their fee is more than the architect's fee. So we had to hire a Naguda Acoustic, and they built a big 1 to 10 model testing the acoustics. And, and it's all CNC wood. And it's the Yonat. I, should, I could give a whole lecture on this, but I won't. Um, and the last project is Detail the Haptic Realm. And this is opening on the 28th of October. It's the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. You know, they're really about science, the arts, 
physics, the humanities, nature, and that was my idea of that they all should intertwine. It should be more or less a one-story building. And this was a competition against the Ram Coolhouse and uh, Todd and Billy and MAS, and it was a competition that we won. And with this idea of intertwining with nature, and when you walk through the building, you would see, you know, water gardens on both sides because it would be, it would have pinch points. But then the roof would be curved like a, what I call a space curve, when two curves intersect each other. Like the skin of a baseball, you know, that strange shape. Well, that's a space curve. And that relates in a, in a small way to Einstein's thinking. So I had to check it with Einstein. <laughs> And I thought, you know, I got to check it with the big masters. And uh, it seemed like it worked OK. And there you see, this is Einstein. This is where he did his last work, right here, Cold Hall, 1939. And his, his office studio was there. And our building was here, right there. So right from the beginning, I wanted to connect to the green copper roofs. And I remember when I was walking on the campus, we all had to meet together. You know, Rem is walking beside me. And he said, what are you doing? I says, I'm taking some notes about roofs, but don't you, don't you use that idea. He didn't. And that was, that was the concept, that this intertwining and then the notion of space curves and the intersection. So you can see, it's, the program is really about meeting. A cafe, a large conference room for big meetings, and and several small conference rooms, and the, the fact that you can walk through the building on grade. And then the idea of the light fixtures, the blown glass is also in space curves. You see where there's two spheres intersect. And, and all the details. And one of the interesting details is that these, and I met with these physicists, mathematicians, amazing people. But they did not want whiteboards, and they didn't want computer screens in their conference rooms. They wanted black slate chalkboards. And I, to me, that was very interesting. Here are these amazing people you know, working on incredible you know, advanced theories. But then it goes back you know, to the idea of drawing as thought, right? And the white chalk. And so we did the blackboards make the rooms, some of the rooms are half pieces of slate. And that's one of the reasons the building was late for seven months, because the slate had to come. It was held up in the COVID chain of problems. But now it's finished. And, um, and I could just open it for questions. You know, that's, the, the, this will be, you can go down there after the 28th of October and see it. And uh, there's the connections. And, and uh, maybe if you have any questions, I don't know, do we, or are we going to do questions? We could just open it for questions. Then. Well, it was called questions of perception. I was hoping that someone have a question. Sure. Good, a question. If you, is there another principle you didn't talk about today that you might keep going back to that you would add? Is, is there something else that you find to be relevant today that you might add to the principles you've already yes. mentioned? Yes, in, in the question of time. Because I made, and I, I, didn't, I didn't put that in this lecture, but I, I made a text called, uh, it was with Sanford Quinter, and it was called color light time and there's a text where I said there's seven types of time you know how architecture it's the duration of the making and like I said sometimes it's longer to design it than it does to build it then there's a duration of building it then there's a duration of the life of the building itself right so these are all different types of time in architecture and I wrote this seven types of time and I realized I left out the most important one the measurable Immeasurable space, immeasurable time. And I think Lou Kahn was really about that, right? And uh, that was a big mistake, because now it's a book, and it's missing the most important, <laughs> the most important part. But I think it's all right. I mean, you, 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 you move on. You work, like my urban, urbanism's book is called Working with Doubt. I think we have to do something and try and work with doubt and then apologize if we made a mistake, you know? Um, 
like someone says, don't ask questions, do it and apologize later, you know? So I'm sorry I missed that point. But this, this book has been in five different runs, three with ANU and two with William Stout Architecture Books, but it's out of print now. Yeah, I, um, you mentioned Larry Halprin. I wanted to, I was curious about the influence of one of your teachers, um, to be Rich Haig. Oh yes, fantastic. Yeah, I wanted to be, after studying with Richard Haig at the University of Washington, I wanted to be a landscape architect. You know, he was a most charismatic figure and uh, really inspirational. And he, would, he gave this uh, class, when I first went to the school, it was 1967 or 68, he gave this class, there were things called blue books, and you're supposed to write, you know, a, an essay. What do you do as a landscape architect to start before you start your design work. And people had written like these, you know, like filled up the place. And at the end of the, the term, he had a stack of these and he opened up one with three words and he said, be the site. That's, this is the correct. And I mean, he was a kind of guy that you just, he, he was like a Zen, uh, a teacher who was, who was a Zen and a very jolly man and a very intelligent man. And, uh, then, so, when I came to San Francisco, I went to work for Lawrence Halpern as a landscape architect for, for two and a half years. And uh, I still believe firmly in landscape, the, the relation of landscape architecture and architecture. It's intertwined, you know, it needs to be intertwined. And, uh, and Halpern was, yeah, uh, an interesting, very interesting figure in the history of landscape. Maybe. Did you work for Larry? Oh. But he's archives. Oh, that's right. He's, he's in the same as the con work. That's fantastic. Um, a quick question. Uh, it seems that the, the text at least began with um, a subjective, if not personal, uh, approach. And all of your um, work process also begins with your vision of a perspectival space. Etc. And the question is, over time, when you worked in different countries, different contexts, to what extent were these subjective uh, perceptions inflected by culture? Well, always, I think they, they, I mean, I always try to really make the work in a deep relationship to the culture. I mean, I'm not saying I always succeed, but I mean, when we did the Mumbai Museum, I was looking at the step wells of India and the idea that this building could be, you know, related to that incredible, you know, store of great architectural spaces in these step wells, you know, the historic, I mean, I just hope they preserve them, you know, they're, they're in danger in a lot of places now, but that, that was, that was the, you know, that was the hmm, beginning, modus operandi, you know, and uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's not always so easy, but I think the work that I've done in China, I wouldn't do here. I wouldn't do it in Europe. I mean, uh, the horizontal skyscraper is just for Shenzhen. It has to be tropical. You know, it's 20 meters off the ground, so the sun, you need, you need the shade and the sun works, and that, that's a tropical landscape that's given back to the public. So that, that, but I would never do that in New York or, you know, Boston or something like that. So, yeah, it, I try to make it specific. There's one here. Thank you. Um, I've noticed that in many of your works, for example, like the house, the, based on like the Bartok piece, as well as like the Hamsun Center, like based on like external non-architectural sources of inspiration, what ex which exactly of these phenomenal zones would you consider this device, this sort of um, I can't quite idea to be in? What's the question? Like um, I noticed that many of your works they involve like external sources of source of inspiration as like the generator of like um, the form, for example, like in the uh, the Stretto House. For, as well as like um, the Hamsun Center, so I was like wondering, the like, Hamsun which, Center, right? Which form of like, which zone of phenomenology would you like sort of categorize that, at, if any? 
And that I think the Hamsen Center really is about being in Hamaroy, Norway, above the Arctic Circle. So the question of how light comes in the building is enormously important. And there, the light doesn't really go above the horizon. In fact, it goes below the horizon uh, around the 17th of December. It's gone until February. So positioning these openings that would streak across the inside of that building was very important, how that, how that light would be horizontal strips of light moving in the building. And then the building is really based more on the literature of Newt Homsen than it is on anything else. It's a crazy idea, you know, a building as a body with invisible forces, you know? I mean, you know, I mean, I, that building probably would never get built except for this one person who came out of the woodwork north of Hamroy. And, you know, the building was, you know, it was very controversial. There were like 300 articles against the building, you know. It was in the newspaper all the time, you know, for a while, in 1996, 97, 98, 99. But then it went dead and it was gone. It was in a drawer. I, I just forgot about it because it was just too controversial for the community. But this guy um, came forward and he said, I really believe this is an important building because of Newt Homsen's life. His story needs to be told. You know, there's a big controversy of, over this author. And my, my opinion was there, there are dark corners in a person's life, but young people need to see that. And, but they need to see everything, like the fact that he wrote Hunger, which is this first surrealist novel. And by the way, I went to Franz Kafka's library in Prague and found that all of Newt Homsen's work was in Frank, Franz Kafka's library. So he influenced Franz Kafka, right? Um, so, yeah, there were problems. I mean, it's a long story, but because I was an American, my father, my grandfather was Norwegian. My father was full-blooded Norwegian. I was connected to Norway, but I had a different attitude about how to deal with the history. I think it should be presented. You know, this story should be told. And this guy came forward, and he went to the government, and they funded it. I don't know how he did it. But then... Then they said it had to be there for his 150th anniversary. It's got to be, it has to open on the 4th of August. Shh. It was sitting in a drawer for like four or five years, and then suddenly it's got to be built in 14 months. Whoosh. You know. Anyway, we did it. The Norwegians did it, actually. They worked night and day. Three shifts. Eight, 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 eight. They had some lights. It was dark in the wintertime. They had big spotlights and big searchlights. Yeah, and it opened, and it was really an amazing thing. And uh, I, st I went to the 10th anniversary. It's a, it's a tourist place, but it's also about literature. It's about the work of Newt Hobson. So that's a complicated story. That's a complicated answer to a short question. I think that's probably it, right? We can. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay.